Today our guest was born in New York, United States. He attended Santa Maria Elementary School and the Christian Academy Japan from 7th to 9th grade. He has been playing soccer competitively from a young age and played for Tokyo Verity Youth and represented the U.S. national team at the Under-17 World Cup in 2011. At the Under-17 World Cup, he was one of the main players to lead the United States to the Final 16 of the tournament. He has played for numerous professional teams including HA Jalai FC, FC Sagamihara, Portland Timbers, and currently the Las Vegas Lights. He primarily plays a defensive midfield role, but is also capable of playing central and right midfield positions. He is a global citizen with three passports from Japan, U.S., and Switzerland, while being bilingual in Japanese and English. Uh, thank you for joining us for episode 30, the last episode of season three, Moby. And um, I want to jump off with a question about your experience playing for the U.S. under 17. So you are one of the key figures to lead the U.S. under 17 to the round of the final 16 in 2011. And this is not my words. This is actually the word uh, from MLS Soccer and their website. Okay. So can you tell me a bit more about that run? And what was it like playing in Mexico at that tournament? That's a, it's a once-in-a-lifetime experience for sure, playing in a World Cup on any level you know, of you know, play. So I participated in the U-17 World Cup in 2011, which was held in Mexico. And then I represented the U.S. I went with the U.S. team. I do have three passports. I have a U.S. passport, a Japanese passport, and a Swiss passport. But um, the U.S. called me first, so I chose with them, with the U-17s. And then, um, yeah, playing in Mexico was, it was one of the best highlights of my career at a young age so far. So it was definitely, it definitely helped me, definitely, uh, brought me to the next step in the game towards, you know, becoming pro after the World Cup. Well, you mentioned an interesting point about being a three passport holder. Prior to playing for the US, were you considering waiting a bit to see if Switzerland says anything or Japan says anything or were there anything already on, on the table at that point? Um, honestly, like it, everything happened so fast um so i was playing club soccer in tokyo with a team called tokyo veldi at the time and then so after the u15s we jumped to the u18s and then with the u18 team it's it consists of grades of three grades so basically in japanese it's koichi koni kosan which is um 10th 11th 12th grade i think in the states so when i enter the u18 team usually you know there's it starts with the a team b team and c team and usually once you make that step from the u15 to the u18s um you know the first graders usually don't make that step to the to the a team but i was lucky enough to make the a team when i was you know when i was first coming into the u18 team you know one tournament I played, I played a one tournament, the summer tournament. It's called the J Youth. If you heard of it before, yeah, yeah. And I had a good, yeah, and then um, I had a good performance there. And then um, out of nowhere, this um, there was this agent that watch was watching the tournament, and he was like, "Yo, do you have a U.S. passport?" And I was like, "Yeah." And he's like, "Yo, I got connects to the U17 uh, national team. If you're interested, I'm like, hell yeah, you know, sign me up." <laughs> so that's you know that was the start of the whole U.S. national team. Uh, set up. And that's that. It's a crazy like it, the way it happened. Now that you're playing in Japan, but they they basically took you away. They took you away to the yeah, state. basically yeah. <laughs> Going back to sort of that experience uh, at Verdi, when you were playing in the youth system in Japan, you also played some years as a uh, you know at the youth level in the states. And mm -hmm. some uh, I think you told me off air six months in Switzerland. So mm -hmm. at the youth level, how do those three countries compare? So like, uh, that's a good question. Well, playing in Japan definitely at a young age helped me become like a technical footballer. Um, I grew up playing a center back as well. I started off playing forward um, when I was like five, six years old, up until I was 10, 11 years old when I first joined Tokyo Veldi at the uh, end of fifth grade. And then I went in as a forward, but they converted me to a center back. And then, you know, I was like, all right, cool. I, you know, I'll play center back. And then up until, actually up until I started my first professional contract, I played center back. And then when I went into the pros, they turned me into more of a de uh, defensive midfielder. And then I've been playing, you know, I'm a versatile player. And then I think the Japanese system of having such good technical players helped me 
into the player I am right now. Mm-hmm. And then um, just the Switzerland style, they're just more, you know, they're more bigger guys, faster guys than the Japanese. So it's more of a bit of a physical country, I think. And then the U.S. is just, you know, there's a bunch. Of, it's more physical. And then, but there's a lot of Hispanic players. So it's actually pretty technical at some point, surprisingly enough, in the States. When, when it comes to changing positions, I've always wondered to what extent do coaches, especially at the younger ages, sort of impose it on players? And do some players, you, you, you were kind of very cool about changing positions. Mm-hmm. Did you ever have teammates who were like, nah, I'm a striker. <laughs> like, like, put me on the uh-huh. bench, you know, if you're not going to start me. Yeah, um, I'm sure, you know, growing up, there's definitely stubborn players where, you know, I'm like, I'm not changing positions. But to be honest, you know, I really didn't know much about, you know, soccer growing up because my parents weren't really into soccer. You know, for me, it was just I was happy to be on the field, whichever position, I, you know, I played. So that kind of stuck to me ever since for now, you know, as long as I'm in the field, I'm happy. So, I, you know, wherever for me, at least. I'll play anywhere. So you just said your parents weren't that interested. That's actually, I had very falsely always identified anyone who played a lot of soccer as having parents who were into soccer. Um, yeah. So were your parents pretty surprised like when you were going full, full-time full soccer? I have to go back to when I was like six years old when I was born in New York and then I moved to Tokyo with my family when I was um, six years old. And then I joined, I actually went to a Japanese school my first three years when I moved to Japan. You know, one of my homies who was close to, you know, who I was close with in the first grade was like, he joined the soccer team. So he was like, yo, Mo, you want to join? And I was like, yeah, why not? You know, I like to run around. I like to, you know, I like to be outside. So that's how the whole soccer thing started. So my parents, you know, my parents are both um, artists. It's a very contrasted, you know, relationship between art and soccer. But at the end of the day, you know, they support me full. So yeah, that, that's really unique. An artist background, but an athlete's mm-hmm. son. When you play soccer, you know, going back to sort of the three passports, the multiculturalness of your background, have you felt like that has helped you as a player, especially in regards to linguistics? Yeah, definitely. Because no matter team I go to, you know, there's people from different con- countries all over the world. Like even my team right now in Las Vegas, we have about eight to nine nationalities on the team. So, you know, there's Spanish, there's Portuguese, there's English in the locker room. So it's definitely, you know, it definitely benefited me, you know, being bilingual on and off the pitch. You know, I could, you know, get into heated conversations in English or Japanese. So it's definitely, it definitely helped me. Interesting. And um, you mentioned Spanish, Portuguese in the locker room. I assume you also, well, I don't assume, I know you speak Japanese and English because we've spoken mm-hmm. in both those languages. Yeah. Do you also speak Swiss? Uh, so Switzerland, well, they speak three to four languages, which is mainly Swiss, German, French, and Italian. And then there's like this mountain language where nobody really speaks. But, um, but sadly, I don't speak Swiss German. I don't know. I, my, I grew up only speaking Japanese and English. So I definitely do want to take on a third language, though, in the future. And I guess in being in the States playing soccer, you sort of uh, become accustomed to speaking a bit more Spanish than before. I imagine. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I know pretty, I mean, I know a lot of bad words in Spanish, but, you know, also a lot of football lingo. So I could pass speaking a little Spanish here and there. I apologize if this question is rather elementary, but um, mm-hmm. I am involved with soccer, obviously at a much, much lower level, um, just, you know, middle school, high school level. But I often get asked the question, um, you know, how can my son improve? You know, how can my daughter improve? So how how would you respond to that question? Because I, I often feel like I never really have the right answer. Yeah, I mean, no, that's a difficult question to begin with. But, you know, I feel like just touching the ball constantly at a young age. You know, I used to play soccer in the house all the time. I used to mm-hmm. dribble through chairs, you know. I think those little details of you know just how it's playing touching and inside if your parents allow it you know (laughs) but um yeah so I think honestly I think you know just touching the ball consistently you know 10 hours a day five hours a day is the way to go yeah that's a great point just being able to to play indoors and I guess as you said Mm -hmm. hopefully your parents allow it 
And in that yeah. case, it, you know, it doesn't have to be a soccer ball. It could be a little, even, you know, like a bouncy ball that doesn't break stuff in the house. So growing up, um, did, did you have any siblings that you would play soccer with or, or were you an only uh, child? I'm an, I'm an only child, but um, I always have friends over. So my, I actually had a really tough schedule to compare to, I think, normal kids because I would go to school during the day and then after school I would just go straight to practice and then that was my life ever since I was six seven years old on, up until now how many hours of football would you say that consisted of a, a, in a weekly schedule so by the time I was 13 I was already training five times a week so that's about two hour two and a half hours each session give or take 12 hours 13 hours yeah because um, I'm sure you've been exposed to this ideology living in the States, but American athletes, like even LeBron James, um, you know, mm-hmm. play three sports or all, until okay, yeah. college. So I was wondering, mm-hmm. what, what is your perspective uh, in regards to sort of that ideology versus in Japan? Obviously, it's mm-hmm. play one sport, mm-hmm. you know, for your full uh, high school, mm-hmm. middle school. I think playing different sports is beneficial for a number of reasons well let's say if you if you're pursuing to become a soccer player let's say and then you know if you play basketball for you know a semester or even football for a semester i think you could take you know some good you could steal some good you know techniques i would say from you know from basketball or from football or whatever sport you play and you, i think you could kind of integrate that into soccer in a positive way whatever sport whether it's swimming you know so I feel like I feel like it's kind of good from a young especially at a young age if you play different sports so I, I think a lot of kids dream of being a soccer player right and at mm-hmm. some point whether it's age 12 or 10 or 15 that that dream is often faded or is gone and in your case you were actually able to you know achieve becoming a professional soccer player mm-hmm. but throughout your career has there been ever moments where you know you you felt like it it was very difficult being a soccer player and you wanted to pursue something Mm -hmm. else yeah no of course i mean i'm sure a lot of people don't know this about me but um i have i definitely haven't had an easy career you know i'm not in the premier i'm not in you know any of the big leagues that i wanted to be or i'm still aiming to be so um no yeah definitely there was hard times you know i almost i tried to quit about two to three times after I became a pro just because for reasons, you know, such as I had a bad agent and, you know, these transfers didn't work out or, you know, you run into a bad coach at times. So, you know, there's, there's different, you know, there's different, there's definitely good years and bad years, but to be a great soccer player, you got to be consistent every time, which is probably, the most difficult part of being an athlete in any sports Mm -hmm. but um yeah i definitely it was definitely hard times for sure and then you know people close to me definitely they definitely know that you know it's not a it's not definitely not an easy ride or i didn't have an easy ride what would you be what would you say is the toughest part of being a professional athlete that maybe most people don't realize i think the toughest part is just staying fit for Mm -hmm. you know 10 20 years of whatever your career is with whether it's injury or you know your physique what you eat so i i recently changed my diet and then um i've been eating clean because when i was younger i was like you know i could eat whatever i want and then i could still perform but i feel like i, I realized you know these past couple this last year you know 25 20, 26 this year that you know what you put in your body actually does help you know on the field I think you know a diet is a big part of performance and it's also the hardest part i think for well, me when you least, say, uh, I, I like food yeah it's uh <laughs> yeah. You, you see like some of the the diets like people put on instagram you know like athlete yeah. diet. And, um, it, it doesn't look like the most uh, uh pleasurable food items yeah, yeah. <laughs> for sure <laughs> would you say your teammates then um and like just the the athletes around you would there be when you say eating clean are, are, mm. you, are you are you saying like um Apart from just cutting out, you know, food that's unhealthy, would that mm-hmm. include a lot of vegans and vegetarians? So, yeah, I've actually been staying away from red meat this past uh, two, three months. So I've, I've been only eating like chicken and turkey and that those those are my main sources of protein. And then just rice, you know, I've been only eating brown rice and then 
it's just little things, you know, that I try to kind of stay healthy and just a better diet. Um, yeah, the rice part, it, it's tough being um, part Japanese, right? I, I have yeah. trouble staying away from the rice. I love my <laughs> hakumai. <laughs> and, um, you know, you're mentioning uh, earlier how you're, you're turning 26 this year, right? It, yeah. What you know, many would consider sort of entering the peak time as a footballer. So what, what mm -hmm. would be your main ambition as a footballer, um, both short term and long term? That's a good question. Well, when I was 18, you know, I had this image where I was playing in, you know, the Premier League <laughs> or, you know, the Bundesliga. But that's, you know, it's I'm not there yet. So, you know, I still that is and will always be my goal is, you know, to play in one of the top teams in the world or the top leagues in the world. So, yeah, that's my short term goal within, you know, the next two or three years. By the time I'm 28, 29, that's where I will want to be. But, you know, if, if not, you know, I'll, I definitely still want to be playing by the time I'm 32, 33. So no matter what, you know, level or league it is. So I'll probably still stick to soccer my whole life pretty much. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious, when players leave teams, do you follow these teams closely? And the reason I ask is I'm a Tokyo Verity fan. And okay. um, we, we, uh, we've been struggling the last yeah. decade. So. 10 years or so yeah so do you like um look look at the teams like that you used to play on quite actively mm -hmm. or is it sort of oh, like yeah, once no. um, or like it has gone you're off no i definitely i follow so i've played on one two three so this is my fourth professional team and then you know i still follow all my other previous teams on social media so i'm always on check you know what are, what they're up to if they would be playing good playing bad you know so there, there's definitely a strong connection on whatever team i played for this is uh, another sort of a coach's sort of question or slash philosophy uh, which i'd like to pick your brain with is um there's always a conversation uh, in sports about nature versus nurture right how much of it is mm -hmm. hard work and how much of it is natural talent so based on your personal experience and you know the players you've played with can you think of examples of players where like they were just like the laziest people ever yet they were just amazing footballers and then vice versa mm -hmm. where there were players that you played with that were just workhorses best yeah, you know yeah. what do you call it a uh, work ethic but they weren't quite the best players well yeah so i feel like once you're at a certain level of a player let's say to be honest, because I don't like once you're at that level of being a pro or, or you're at that cups of almost being a pro, there's not that much of a big difference of, you know, players of one to one. Because I feel like if you're already at that point and then let's say just out of nowhere, boom, you play, you jump in with Manchester United and you're playing alongside Pogba and, you know, and all these players that have talent. And then that will make you could, I bet you if you're at, you know, at this level, and they start you with all these players around you, I guarantee you, you we could play mm -hmm. even in these, you know, whatever leagues we are in, because the people around you are world class. And what I'll and to go back to your question is, in Japan, there's a lot of people that work hard. It's, you know, I think it, it's in the culture. So growing up, you know, we would train and after training, we would do Jushiden, which is you know individual training with with you know small groups or by yourself and then we used to do that for you know 30 to 40 minutes after training almost every day and that was in japan but um you know when you come over to the states you know there's not really there's not really that culture of staying behind and playing you know working on individual individual skills as much you know as much as japan but um yeah but there's definitely players where you know they work a lot but they don't really show that progress on the field. So there, you know, there's, you know, you have to have talent at some, at, at least a little bit to play the game, no matter how hard, because I've seen players, you know, they put in hours and hours and hours a day and then boom, you play them on the field, but they don't, it doesn't relate. So to me, it's just, oh, he doesn't really have it. You know, you, some, you have to have a little bit of talent to succeed in, I think, any sports. But obviously, you know, putting in the hours definitely counts. But at the end of the day, I think it's just a balance between talent and working working out a lot and, you know, putting in the hours. That's intriguing. So that you're saying there's sort of like a minimal level 
of talent. Yeah, that's required. I think so. Yeah. Cause you know, I've played in the world cup and then I see these players play for Liverpool, you know, they're on, I played against them in the world cup and then, you know, when I played 1v1 against them, you know, I don't, I didn't feel that big gap. I was like, oh, you know, oh, like I can't defend this guy or, oh, I can't go past this guy. I was like, you know, once I'm in that game and in the zone, you know, I feel like, oh, oh, I could do this, you know. Yeah, I feel like it also has to do with a lot of confidence. Soccer is like, if you also, it's a lot of a, a mind game, I think. It's, you know, if you have confidence, you have confidence, you, you know, you won't give up the ball. So, so it's also a big mind game. That's intriguing. Yeah. To, to know that, that there, there's that level. And as you mentioned, you feel like that gap is so small at that top level. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. So you went to um, CAJ grade seven to nine. Yep. And yep. this is uh, Tokyo, <laughs> Tokyo alumni yep. podcast as well. I was actually Santa Maria. Surprisingly, a lot of people yep. from Santa Maria on this podcast yeah. so far. Oh, really? And okay, okay. Yeah, that's uh, surprising because it's not the biggest uh, of schools. Yeah, um, it's probably the smallest school, actually. <laughs> and um, I was wondering what parts, um, I know you didn't play for the soccer teams, but mm-hmm. um, do you have any memories that sort of relate from, from your time at either Santa Maria or CAJ? You know, who's... Yeah, I mean, just being going to Santa Maria. So I joined at, at um, Santa Maria at the end of third grade. You know, I was in Japanese school through first, second, and third grade. And then it, my parents thought it was time for me to, you know, to go to international school. And then, yeah, that's, I think it was the best decision for me to go to international school at that point in age because it was so diverse. And then I got to meet, you know, kids from 10, 20 countries in one grade. And then, you know, I feel like you don't really get that experience unless you go to international school. So for me, going to, you know, international schools was good because, you know, from at a, from a young age, we didn't have that barrier of race, you know, because, mm-hmm. you know, we were all together in such a, you know, a small space with, you know, 10, 20 countries, like the, uh, nationalities. So to me, that was a norm, that was a norm, you know, growing up, you know, with, with all these different types of people all around the world. So I think that was, you know, one of the dopest things about uh, Santa Maria. Yeah, it's funny because now you are on a team with nine plus nationalities. And <laughs> yeah, it's like, yeah. like it prepared you for it in advance, huh? Mm-hmm. So um, at the end of the podcast, I like to have the guests sort of say, you know, what's to come in the next year, next few years. Okay. I know you've already touched upon this. Uh, but nonetheless, I just want to keep the format. So <laughs> I'm going to go ahead yeah, and ask yeah. you uh, what, what, is, uh, what is on the horizons for the upcoming years for you. So my contract with the lights this year is, you know, it's, uh, it's uh, up at the end of the year. So, you know, we'll see what happens next. I mean, that's pretty much the life of a soccer player is I come, you know, end of the year. It's like, all right, what's next? Like, where am I going to go next? Am I going to stay at this team? Am I going to sign with a new team? So I can't really answer that question at the moment because I don't really know what's going to happen, which is also kind of exciting because every year, you know, I might be traveling to a different country or, you know, so for now, I don't know what's going to (laughs) happen. I was going to say for that next decision, um, how much of that Mm -hmm. is um, dictated by your agent and how much of it is by like your opinion? Um, It's actually all player. It's up to the player. It's like you tell your agent, you know, I want to go here or... Or sometimes, you know, the agent be like, yo, I have an offer from here, here, and here. Where do you want to go? Yeah, it's, it, it really depends on the year. If you have a good year, you know, if some other teams might call. And if you don't have a good year, you have to go looking for teams by yourself. Well, the agent has to be like, yo, what do you, I have this player. What do you think? Try not to go look for a team. I'm trying for teams, you know, to call me up and be like, yo, I want you to play for us. So that's my goal for this year is to not look for a team next year. <laughs> It's, it's been nice um, catching up. Um, it's been very educational, too, for me to actually hear someone who's playing mm-hmm. pro about, you know, your perspectives on three sports and nature versus nurture. Um, that apparently there is a minimum, right, for nature. So hard work yeah, helps, so, yeah. but there is that X factor, as you said. There's that uh, yeah, I, I think, I think, yeah, you have to have a little bit, you know. And, uh, yeah, I, I hope um, at the end of this season, especially post-COVID, you know, you – get to play uh where you hope to play and um as a Tokyo Verity fan I mean we'd like you back um, yeah 
<laughs> sometime sure, hell, to yeah. help us out I of this misery. Definitely <laughs> want to go back one day for sure. And um, yeah, on that note, um, that is the end of episode 30. That was Moby Fair. Uh, thank you for joining us. Cool. No, thank you for having me. It was really fun. <laughs>